Stephen, I'd like you to begin by addressing question number five. Uh, what do you think is the most important moment in the political evolution of the East Side? Another great question and a, and a hard question. I don't think I can actually tell you one moment that's the most important moment to the political evolution of the East Side. But let me give you three quick ones that might help to chart some of the some of the changes over you know uh, or in recent decades. Um, moment moment number one might be the establishment of the community service organization um, in Mayfair at the Mayfair School in June of 1952. Um, at that meeting, at the organizational meeting, 130 ethnic Mexicans and, uh, were present, um, and they voted to establish the CSO chapter, and they elected Juan Gallegos as their president. Um, that meeting and its organization also launched Cesar Chavez's career, as many people uh, know, and the, and the careers of many other local um, organizers on the east side um, of various, genera uh, various generations. It established uh, an organization that got very involved in uh, voter registration efforts that shifted the political landscape of the county, um, citizenship drives, um, a drive for pensions for, uh, for um, undocumented members of the community um, who were ret of retirement age, um, a, you know, efforts to drive a new legislative agenda in Sacramento uh, through lobbying, and a kind of training of a generation of leaders that I think you can arguably you know, point to that meeting in June 1952, if you have to have one moment that kind of opened, opened that up in some say. So that would be moment one. Moment two might be, you know, um, roughly 17 years later, um, when, in 1969, um, both the kind of summer and fall of 1969, which is a very, um, uh, you know, exciting, dramatic period of time in, you know, in the country, in the world, and certainly in, in San Jose. Um, in San Jose, San Jose saw two major events in that in that period of the summer and fall of 1969, as I see them. The first was um, what was called the Fiesta de las Rosas Parade, um, and the second was what's been referred to as the as the Justice Chargin incident. So, in the Fiesta de las Rosas Parade, um, this was a public parade that the city of San Jose um, decided to organize and fund that um, tried to put San Jose on the map. You can think like the Pasadena Rose Bowl parade, you know, this, it, as it was practiced back in this period of the 20th century. Um, uh, So-called Spanish conquistadors on white horses, you know, lots of roses. Um, uh, all, these are all white people who are dressed up as conquistadores. Um, a Mexican on a burro um, walking through the streets in this parade. Um, uh, you know, this was a this was a, 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 a an enormous um, uh, it, um, effort by the city of San Jose to kind of market itself and its and its uh, and its false history, right? Um, it was this was an, a moment, an event that was boycotted by Mexican American activists um, who called it a party at our expense in 1969, and about 500 of them turned out to protest. The, um, the the Fiesta de las Rosas, calling it the Fiasco de las Rosas um, instead. This led to mass arrests and then allegations of police brutality um, against the protesters, which in turn, um, you know, generated uh, more political um, ferment in this period. Just a couple months later, the Chargan incident in September of 1969, um, uh, a local superior court um, judge, a justice named Gerald Chargan. Uh, heard a, a court case that involved a charge that a young Mexican American boy had committed incest with his sister. Um, and uh, Chargin from the bench um, released this kind of racist tirade about Mexican Americans in, uh, in San Jose, the East Side, uh, and um, the United States, uh, talking about Mexican uh, so called greasers. Um, threatening this boy with deportation um, and saying things like, you are lower than animals, talking about Mexicans, you are lower than animals, maybe Hitler was right, the animals in our, in our society ought to be destroyed. Um, so this Chargan incident in the fall of 1969, just a few months after the, the protests against the, the, um, the Fiesta de las Rosas, um, motivated a, a generation of people also to take on City Hall, to organize, um, and to protest, I think, in new ways. Obviously, this was happening before 1969, but I think this was 
a kind of catalyzing moment um, when I spoke to local activists for, for many of them. You can see them also um, take, using this moment to argue for the importance of taking on new, taking up space in the city. Um, it's a, it was important to lowriders in the period that they were responding to Chargin and the, the racism of Chargin and the racism of the Fiesta Las Rosas kind of display and the people were gonna display, display for themselves Mexican culture as they saw it. This even, you could suggest, kind of helps to drive another alternative forms of local history telling, which you could say might have culminated in some ways in the creation of the Heritage Plaza in 1999 and so forth. If I was gonna name a third incident, or a third moment, I might point to something that Josie was already referring to with Mark Garcia, and that's the, the rise of the new labor movement in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, uh, you know, largely, or to a significant extent, in this, in this area driven by SEIU, the rise of Latino labor organizers um, and their new presence um, around campaigns um, related to um, immigrant rights, but also labor rights in the region. So these are the three for me, 1952, 1969, and then generally maybe the late 1980s. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Josie. The thing that comes to mind for me is the redistricting of the city. No longer at large elections and we can have representation in San Jose. And that stands really clear because many Chicanos, Mexican Americans, Hispanics, although I think very few people call them, themselves Hispanics in San Jose, that happens in Texas a lot. <laughs> so um, I would say that that's one that um, that we can talk about in the inclusion of women in political life, not just uh, with Blanca Alvarado being elected to, uh, to city council, but other women running for office. So just thought I'd point it out. Thank you, Josie. Uh, yeah, thank both of you. Um, I see, I, when I was kind of writing my, my notes here, I kind of figured that you would talk about the CSO, so that's a big part of the book. Uh, and uh, I agree with you that I don't think you can pinpoint one particular moment, um, right? You, it's even hard to pinpoint three, um, right? Because you had the establishment of many political organizations with the very first one, right, kind of being uh, the CSO. But even if you go back a little further, when you have the Comisión Olímpica Mexicana, right, here in San Jose, which looked to uh, right, which were the, the, the first sponsors of, yes, of the Fiestas Patrias. They themselves, right, were very politically active in the city. Uh, so you can kind of date back even further with regards to the establishment of that organization uh, in the late 1930s. Uh, but, right, and then you have other organizations like the Mexican American Political Association that's founded in 19, that's started in 1960 or 1961. Uh, right, you have the CSO, you have the American GI Forum. Uh, you have the Confederación de la Raza Unida, which is, Right, which was kind of born out of the violence from the Fiesta de las Rosas. Um, but I think one thing that's kind of overlooked is uh, the establishment of a local newspaper uh, in 1949 at Eccentrico. Uh, I think just the fact that there was a Spanish language newspaper that the community could read that was coming from the community uh, is very political in nature. Uh, that newspaper was very important with regards to establishing an identity for Latinos here in San Jose for communicating what was happening, right? The CSO, the American GI Forum, all of these organizations utilized the newspaper as a way to promote their activities and to promote uh, their celebrations and to promote their agendas. Uh, so I think it's an often overlooked part of the history of San Jose, right? Is looking at uh, El Eccentrico, which is, one of, which is one of the things that I did in my dissertation. I really focus on uh, looking at the over 30 years that, that newspaper was published and looking at those primary sources uh, and looking at how that newspaper actually impacted Latinos here in San Jose. Um, with regards to the Piesa de, de, de Las and so, right, so kind of the same time period, 1952, I'm saying 1949, uh, with regards to the Piesa de Las Rosas, I think it's important to note that although it was protested by Chicano youth, uh, there were Latinos, there were Mexican Americans that were part of the uh, coordinating committee uh, because it was very much a class issue as well. There were businessmen here in San Jose, Latino businessmen, who, who saw the fiesta as a way to promote their businesses, right? As a way of boosting uh, the city and a way of bringing people to the city, bringing tourism that would help them economically, right, with regards to their own businesses. 
So again, when we try to step back a little bit and not look at ourselves as a monolith, not looking at ourselves as, as homogenous, there are class differences that also come into play. Uh, and then Josie talked about district elections, the arrival of district elections in 1980. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, and then when we look at kind of district elections and the arrival of district elections, it touches on what both of you already talked about with regards to coalition building. Because it wasn't just driven by Latinos. Uh, there were a lot of homeowner organizations, right, that saw the value in district elections. And so this was Latinos participating and organizing with other groups in the city, right, in order to bring about district elections. Uh, and so since then, right, we've had a city council member uh, of Latino descent uh, since 1980. Uh, the arrival of district elections really institutionalized the east side as a Latino seat. Uh, and I think it speaks volumes of the fact that I think we have about four members today in city council that are of Latino descent. Uh, we have, I think, another two or three that are of Vietnamese descent. And so we have a very diverse city, and it's now being reflected in our city government because of the arrival of district elections. And so I think that's a very important year to kind of keep in mind with regards to like, kind of uh, important political moments in the city. Thank you. Uh, Josie, did you want to add this? Yeah, the thing that um, I, I want to bring it to the national question that you talked about. So, one of the places that intercession by government policies came through is with the economic and social opportunities programs. And uh, basically, it opened up housing, it opened up um, redevelopment uh, opportunities for Mexican Americans in San Antonio for Chicanos. And I think that as we tell the stories about the community, we also need to tell the stories of institutions and organizations that supported or challenged us to become the people that we are. So, you know, and many leaders, activists emerged from that area. Richard Rios comes to mind and he's floating in there, so I'm going to go ahead and say that he. Uh, ESO, Economic and Social Opportunities, which made available options for men and women to become vocationally trained. Uh, organizations such as the Opportunist Industrialization Center, which was, and it came through federal funding. That's why I'm mentioning it. So it has to do with national entities. And um, which later, you know, emerged into the Center for Employment Training. Um, a pretty big organization that's nationwide um, that made available options for employment for people who otherwise would have never had it. So there is such a story to tell that if we try to fragment it into moments or particular instances, we're going to miss, miss the stories of the people that created the possibilities for our community. And we need to keep telling the stories. Please write in whatever format so we can get them out there to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. So the final question, uh, what does the story of the East Side teach us and how can we apply that knowledge? I think that for me, it's the story of people who have the capacity and the, the ability and the desire to participate in the political process and to make their culture and their history visible despite the contestation that dominant society places upon them. Um, that although San Jose is not recognized nationally like, like LA or San Francisco, that we're in par with them and that we have a very a strong community with people who have made significant <clears throat> contributions and that it's possible to do that anywhere so long as uh, the political process incorporates us as equal citizens as we've been fighting to be incorporated. That's it. Thank you, Josie. Uh, uh, so I think before we answer the question, right, we have to say, right, if the question is, what does the story of the East Side tell us, well, what is the story of the East Side? Uh, and I think the story of the East Side is a story of social, cultural, political, and economic resilience. Um, and I think uh, the story of the East Side, the story of Latinos in San Jose, is 
a very familiar story to other ethno-racial minorities, to other Latino groups uh, in other parts of the country. And I think that what we can learn is what we can learn is that change the what we can learn is that equality and equity are not guaranteed, uh, and that's something that we need to fight for. It's not something that's going to be given to us all the time, even though the fact that, even though it should be, it's not. And we need to take it, we need to demand it. Uh, and I think that what we can learn is that generations, our generation, the future generations, is that when we work for these struggles, that change doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen even within our own generation, that it's a persistent struggle and it takes tenacity. It takes persistence and it takes a lot of resilience. Um, and I think that's just something that future generations are kind of keep in mind that even though they might not see the change occurring right away, they need to realize and recognize that history teaches us that change is slow and it happens over time. Thank you, Alejandro. Steve? Yeah, thank you. I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, three things occur to me. One, I think the story of the East Side you know, reminds us that um, these histories are um, shaped by developments at different scales. They're very, very local, but they're also national and international histories that are present here in the East Side. You can't understand the East Side's growth and formation without understanding, you know, things at the level of like the individual and the household and the street corner and the street and, the, you know, the neighborhood. But also, this is an area that's shaped by big developments nationally and internationally. Um, so, you know, we need to keep our, our eyes on that and if we tell the story correctly, I think that we, we, uh, we somehow juggle all of those balls and think, think about them that way. Um, you know, the second is that I think the story of the East Side in some ways is the story, arguably the story about how the margin moves to the center. I mean, East Side is so, the East Side is so marginalized over time, actively, um, for reasons that are intimately tied up with racism and classism and a dismissal of certain types of types of, of people and workers. Um, and that's part of the story of the East Side. And yet the East Side also, as has been said, um, is home to such tremendous, um, such tremendous people, right? Such, such incredible artists, thinkers, activists, family members, leaders, and others. And so Folks that are marginalized oftentimes, in this case, have been able to move into the center and really define um, define the larger region in ways that I think are really exciting. That's perhaps romantic, but I think there's real, the real arguments for how that actually has happened in many ways. And third and finally, and this I think you know echoes what in some ways what's already been said. If we want to tell the story of a place like the East Side, we need to do the hard. We need to work hard. I mean, you know these, you know. These stories were not um, uh, ones that were recorded in many archives 30 and 50 years ago. Uh, many of the people who, um, who who led the way and experienced the things we're talking about did have an opportunity to share their stories, write the things down that Josie's encouraging us to do today, which we urgently need to do. Um, and so we need kind of community-centered, community-based methodologies, including oral histories, maybe especially oral histories, that allow us to um, collect uh, and understand what's happened and then be able to talk about this, share it with other people, and interpret it. So for me, that kind of the idea of local and international scales, the margin becoming the center, and the, the desperate need for community-centered methodologies, which I think my co-panelists you know, have really pioneered in their work and their understanding of the East Side are really, really important. Well, Stephen, thank you very much. And well, thank all of you very much. That concludes the uh, final question.